Well, uh, I have the task of concluding this series. Um, haven't you enjoyed hearing other speakers uh, here at Anchor Chapel? I've really enjoy having uh, just talented communicators all around me in this church. And one of the things we want to do and uh, as pastor, I always like to cast vision. And one of the things we want to build is a culture that is, 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 is centered around Christ, that Christ is in the middle. And you understand when Paul begins to write about the gifts of the church, he never says one holds the throne except for Jesus. But he says he gives gifts to the body, and there is a multiplicity of gifts. And so although I'm the senior pastor here, I have other people that can preach, and it's the Word of God, so it's all good, right? So um, y'all not going to wear me out preaching 52 weeks a year, (laughs) twice a year when I have other people preaching here, but that doesn't mean that you vacate church, oh, pastor's not preaching this week. No, I come to hear from Jesus. And I tell you, every time I get up to preach, you'll see, you'll see my wife pray for me, Kevin pray for me, or me kneel down. And that's called homiletic humility, that I'm just hoping that you guys don't hear me and my ability to communicate, but you hear the Holy Spirit communicating directly to your hearts. Amen? So um, that's why we do that. And over the summer, as we get ready to go into our summer series, Broadway is colliding with Anchor Chapel, and uh, we're going to preach through Hamilton this summer. And so I'm excited about that. So don't miss a week. It must be nice to have Washington on your side. It must be nice. But uh, today, I want to conclude season. Say seasons. And our foundational text is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. Uh, if you have it, say amen. Amen. <laughs> Good. Y'all are so smart. It's on the screen. That is awesome. But Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity where? Let's say it again. Ready? Read. For everything, there is a season. A what? A season. For what? Everything. Under what? Everything. All right, let's try. We're going to do, do a better job. All right, we're going to do a better job. All right, those of you who are editing the video, this is the one we're going to put on. All right, ready? <laughs> ready? <laughs> Read. For everything. There is a season. A time. Where? Under heaven. Under heaven. This is the wisest man on earth giving us wisdom that for everything there is a season. I was just talking with Brad, and uh, you know, in this rainy season, he's trying to plant and get ready for the harvest, as Pastor Kevin talked about last week. So in week one, we learned that spring is God's way of saying one more time. One more time, we're watching things bud that people thought was dead and things grow. That's God saying, I am a God of another chance. You can't mess up enough to vacate how much I love you. We learned that in week one. Week two, Pastor T said, in summer seasons, as we grow, we experience the warmth of God's presence, the light of God's presence, and maturity that comes along with God's word. And we learned that, you know, the sugar cane in the summer just boop, just go up. That's the time. And they're getting ready for the harvest season. And that's because in the summer, things are being fostered. And there's a, uh, uh, here, here it is, five cent word photosynthesis, where the plants take the sun and takes the nourishment from the light of the sun, S-U-N, and develop it into the nutrition for it to mature and grow. So we are the same way. We take the light of the word of God from the S-O-N, put it in our body, and it provides the nutrition that we need to mature and grow. And so that is our summer season. Pastor Kevin, as always, did a great job last week of talking about the harvest that comes along in the fall. And fall is a time to harvest what has grown. It is when you get to enjoy the fruits of your labor. 
This is the time we enjoy the fruits of our labor. It's all the work, all the planning that we were talking about, Brad, today. We have a, a farmer in the house, so I can always reference the farmer. And it, as long as he's doing this, I know I'm just saying the right thing. And uh, the moment he go, I don't know about all that. I'm going to be like, hey, change the notes, change the notes. But no. And so fall is the time where we get to enjoy the fruits of planting and watering and going out and pulling the weeds out and all these things. And now all of a sudden we have them good heirloom tomatoes or them Creole tomatoes that you pick fresh from the vine and your grandmother beats you with a switch. I'm traumatized. <laughs> But they're so good are the grapes that grow on the vines and you're able to go steal the grapes off your neighbor's vines. And yeah, are all those great things that happen in the fall. We have to take the time to enjoy those things. But then it comes to what I'm talking to you about today, which is winter. Winter. Winter, here's a quote, is the time for comfort. For good food and warm. And everybody said amen. For the touch of a friendly hand and for talk besides the fire, it's time for home. Everyone in the wintertime just want to get home. I mean, it's like you get in your car. Look, I'm going to go there, but I just want to get in the house. I just want to get away. And the opinion of the winter season is very differentiating. It, it is very, it, it sits on a scale and it's very polarizing when you think about uh, how people think about winter. You have some people like me. I love winter. I absolutely love winter. I get to wear clothes that I never get to wear. I mean, you get to pull out the sweaters, the hoodies, the, the jackets. I mean, you get all these things. You get the, uh, outside of that, we get to have the biggest meals and not feel guilty. Thanksgiving. Oh. Then you have Thanksgiving again the next day. I mean, you get to, you get to have the turk. I love it. And then just when you thought it was over, Christmas dinner. Ooh, oh, my gosh. And just when you thought it was over, you get them the cabbage greens for New Year's. And the black eyed peas, you get to eat all you want in the winter. And we put on our winter coat. It's called pounds. <laughs> and I absolutely love winter. The smell of fire outside. My kids automatically know first chill, chill in the air, put the woods on the fire pit, and let's, let's go ahead and make some s'mores. It's a great time to hang out. But then there's others. Um, oh, I forgot my other favorite part, hunting season. <laughs> That's right. It's a time to kill. That's what Solomon said. It's, <laughs> it's hunting season, one of my favorite times of the year. I don't even have to kill anything. I just like playing dress up. I got all the clothes like I, I can dress to the nines for hunting. But if I never shoot anything, it don't matter. I had a gun. I was in a deer stand and I get to tell stories about going in the deer stand. <laughs> that's, that's so fun. But it's hunting season. So I absolutely love winter. While there's others that hold this season in high disdain because the days are short. The air is cold. The sky is too gray. And people just feel down and depressed because they barely get to see the sun in the wintertime. But I, but I want to bring this full circle for those of you who don't like this. As we learn through this series, God is the orchestrator of all seasons as we navigate through them. And winter is not an exception. Winter is not an exception. Write this down. Winter signifies the end of a cycle. Winter signifies the end of a cycle. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 4 through 7 says this, Generations come and generations go, but the earth never changes. The sun rises and the sun sets, then hurries around to rise again. The wind blows south and then turns north, 
Around and around it goes, blowing in circles. You got me going in circles. But anyway, around and around it goes in circles. Rivers run into the sea, but the sea never is full. Then the waters return again to the rivers and flows out again to the sea. As you can see, everything is a cycle. It's a cycle. Our lives are cycles, just like I was talking to the graduates. You, you went through all the heartache from kindergarten to the 12th grade. Now you get to do it all over again in college. It's a cycle. You go from being the top of the food chain, PJ, in the fifth grade to being the one that's afraid to go to the bathroom in middle school. <laughs> Maybe that's my story. <laughs> I mean, everything is cycles. And so if it's cycles, that means that what I'm going through is only temporary. Yeah. What I'm seeing is only temporary. The hurt and the pain and the disdain and the, and the degradation and the segregation we're seeing in our culture, guess what? It happened before, yeah. but God saw us through it. Yeah. So God is going to see us through it again. Yeah. It is a cycle. Come on. Yeah. But the earth never changes yeah. and God never changes. So if you're in a tough situation, know that it is temporary. There comes a times in everyone's life. There's going to come a time in all of your life. If you high right now, just keep living. That's what my grandma used to tell me. If you low right now, just keep living. There's going to come a time in everyone's life, just as Solomon said, for there is a season for everything, a time for everything under the sun. And so there's going to be times where life feels dark, cold, and the sun feels absent from our lives. Let me tell you a story about this guy that y'all up here laughing at today. In 2003, 2003, I had just, 2002, got ordained as a pastor, gave my life to the Lord. 2003 was a big, 2002 was a big year for me in my walk with the Lord. That was the year I decided that I'll follow God and scream his name as loud as I can for the rest of my life. But at the end of 2002, I started experiencing difficulties uh, neurologically, mentally, and, and socially. I started becoming a very socially awkward person, uh, wanting to lock up in a room all the time, just be by myself. And, and then I started experiencing to where I could not walk out of the house without experiencing fear. I now know that was called agoraphobia, to where the world was so big. It's, it's chicken little. The sky's falling. Um, I, I felt like the world was caving in on me. And, and then a little later in that year, I had a mental breakdown. There were about, I was, if it was not for my wife and my mom, I would have been in a mental institution. Saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized, preaching the gospel, but I lost my mind. I, I literally lost my mind. And it created a disorder that is called PTSD. I have, I have, I still struggle with it daily. God, God can take it away, but uh, it's a part of my testimony. And, and so I still struggle with it. It was a very dark time in my life. I remember sitting in a room crying out to God saying, why? I gave, you could have did this to me when I wasn't serving you. Why is this happening now that I'm serving you? And I remember my wife crying next to me because I can't sleep at night. I'm jumping up. I remember one night we were in the bed and I jumped up and grabbed my gun and almost pulled a bullet, through, a bullet through the wall and would have shot one of my kids because I was suffering. It was a very dark time, but I'm preaching on Sundays. No, I think I was leading worship then. I was leading worship on Sunday and, and doing all these great things and, and God is using me and people are coming to know Jesus. I have my own life group at my house. And God is using me, but they didn't know when they would leave the house, I would go in the room and cry my eyes out. And it felt like a dark time. It felt like I would never come out of that season. Because there's a time in our lives where it's going to be dark. It's going to be down. But I've learned that in the fall and the winter, there's, there's buds like for tulips and things like that. They plant those things in the ground in the dark season. And when you plant them, you would think that it's dead. Why would you plant it this time? 
but the planter knows that they don't die, but they're lying dormant waiting for the proper time to present the world with the beauty that it endured through the dirt. And in that season, God was dealing with me. And I was like, God, why is this happening to me? But then at the, right at the end of that season, when I thought, look, it was suicide. My, my best friend Donovan here, he remember the phone calls about, hey, man, I'm about to kill myself. And he's like, man, quit playing. We was talking about this the other day. Hey, man, quit playing. I'm driving on the road. Hey, man, I'm about to drive off the bridge. And he literally has to talk me out of driving off the bridge, talk me out of pulling the trigger or killing myself and things of that nature. But right at the end of that season, God says, this isn't happening to you, but it's happening through you. Because there are going to be other people that go through dark seasons of their lives, but at the appropriate time, I'm going to release you to tell this testimony, to tell people that depression isn't the end of your life. Stress isn't the end of your life. Sickness isn't the end of your life because the sun always comes out. I know in the winter it feels like you'll never see the sun again, but the sun always come out and shameless plug. There's hope for every soul. That's what it's all about. And so in the winter season, the enemy wants you to think that it's always going to be cold, that it's always going to be gloomy, it's always going to be gray. This is always going to be your life. Your marriage is always going to be, you're always going to be in each other's throat. Your kids are always going to be a rebel against you. But I stand on the word of God that says, if I trained up a child in the way they should go, when they're old, they will not depart from it. Come on. They'll come back to it. I stand on the word where I say, me and my house we will serve the Lord don't we at our oh come on anybody ever went through a winter season where you thought your life was over I'm here to tell you it's all cyclical it goes in a cycle and the sun will come out don't lose hope the Bible says don't grow weary and well doing but you will reap if you what faint not Do you hear me online? You will reap if you faint not. You may be at home right now because you don't want to be around people because you're depressed and and, and you're all all caught up in what's going on in the world and, and all these things have turned your mind inside out. I'm here to tell you that there is a son of the living God who went to Calvary's cross and he gave up his life for you. He went to the grave and he said it wasn't over and he rose again on the third day to give you hope. The sun rises again, as Ecclesiastes says. Are you learning something? I said I wasn't going to preach this morning, but I can't help myself. This is good to me. So the first thing, winter, signifies the end of a cycle. But the second thing is winter is a time for rest. Rest. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 through 10 says this. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. How many of you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. Well, you are the ecclesia, the called out ones. You are the people of God, the believers. There is a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Listen. On the seventh day, what did God do? He rested. rested. If our creator had to set a time for rest, we have to make sure we're setting aside time for rest. And in the winter season, during the winter months, every environment, whether it's, uh, whether it's the marketplace or whether it's the, um, the faith, faith-based world, we um, slow down. We slow things down. Everybody waits to that time of the year where there's a party every week and, and there, there, there's holidays where you're off work and there's things going on on your job. I remember when I worked for a corporate America, when I was in corporate America, I could not wait till the winter time because I knew there were going to be very few work days. Those of you who are in school, y'all know what I'm talking about. It's like every other week you get two weeks off right? And so you're like, I can't wait for it. I'll see you next year, four weeks before the year's out. That's what happens. And everything slows down. Why does this happen? It happens for you to recuperate from all the work you've done and the grinding you did during the year. It's, 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 uh, 
It's very strategic. It's because you push hard during the year, and there has to be a time where you rest. There has to be a time. This tends to be the season that makes it possible for you to succeed in the next one. If you never enjoy your winter season where you're supposed to be resting, you're not ready for the spring season where you're supposed to be working. You need rest in your life. You need to have this, uh, Brad, correct me if I'm wrong. There is times where you have to let the ground rest. You can't just keep working that ground. Every farmer knows you have to let the ground rest. And you have to, eat, no matter how bad you want to plant, no matter how, how, how much you want, but they prepare for that season of rest. They store up for that time to where I can't plant so I have enough in the season where I can't put nothing in the ground. And so, oh my God. So you need to start storing up some God faith. When things are good, that's not time to stop praising him. That's not the time to stop reading your word and, and praying and, and diving in. But I'm storing up for a season to where it seems like the sun is not that close. The reason we have winter is because in the orbit of the earth, we are at a further distance from the sun. So we're not as in close proximity to the sun. So therefore, we are experiencing what happens when we get away from the source of our heat. But because the earth warms up so much in the season that I'm hearing him so clearly, I'm understanding everything I'm reading. The Holy Spirit is talking to me when I'm in Starbucks. I was just ordering uh, 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 at, at CC's. I was ordering me a, a mocha sippy, a turtle mocha sippy. And God says, just like the turtle mocha sippy, I want my church to be multi-ethnic. <laughs> God spoke through a mocha sippy. But then there's seasons you order, you go to the Bible and bookstore and you can't get a word, you know? There, there are seasons. But in that season that I was so close, my core got so warm that even when I don't feel them, I still trust them. Because I still feel the warmth from the previous season. Somebody say, move on. So winter signifies an end of a cycle. Winter also is a time for rest, but this is the next one. Winter is a time for reflection. It's a time of reflection. Psalm 77, 11 through 12, and the message says this. Once again, I'll go over what God has done. I could stop and preach for the whole year on that. Once again, I'll go over. Notice it says once again, which means this isn't the first time I had to take the time to go back and see what God has done for me. He says, lay out on the table the ancient wonders. I'll ponder all the things you've accomplished and give a long, loving look at your acts. This is a statement by Charles Dickens. He said this, reflect on your present blessings of which every man has many, not on, not on your past misfortunes of which every man, which all men have some. Reflect on your present blessings, of which every man has many, not on your past misfortunes, of which all men have some. All, like I said, all of us go through a season where it's dark and it's gray and it seems like the sun isn't out and we're far from the Lord. But that's the time you look back over your life and see how good God's been to you. During this season, we should look back over all that God has done. No matter how hard the prior seasons were, we find that God was good and he remained faithful. Amen. So if your winter, all of us, so on our calendar, we know winter comes up, but in our lives, we never know when winter's going to hit. Wow, that's good. We never know. Just like this rain we had this past week. Goodness gracious. People jet skiing on people, <laughs> flatland, like, <laughs> like gore. I mean, but it, it's, it's, they said April showers, not May showers. <laughs> I thought it was supposed to have May flowers, you know. But this is the thing. 
When winter hits, we have to understand that we can look back and the same God that delivered you from what you went through in the past is the same God that's with you right now when you're going through what you're enduring. He, the same God that gave you that first job is the same God that's going to give you the next job. The same God that brought you together as a family is the same God that's going to keep you together. Come on. It's the same God that's going to do it. The Bible says Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we can always look back. You remember when you had that, that headache that, and you was like, man, God, I never think I'm going to get out of this headache. And then you pray and all of a sudden you realize you go throughout the day, you never realize that the headache was gone. But God answered your prayer. You remember that time that um, you, you were praying to God for something uh, particular and then you forgot about the prayer, but yet that particular thing happened? If all of us look back, we have those testimonies, yes. right? We all have those testimonies. And so in the winter season, it's a time to stop and look back and see the goodness of God that took place in our life. So if God, is, if God did it before, that means... <laughs> he can and will do it again. Amen. Somebody say reflection. So winter signifies the end of a cycle. Winter is a time for rest. Winter is a time for reflection. And here it is. Winter is a time to cultivate relationships. Winter is a time to cultivate relationships. Romans 12, 10 says this. Be devoted to tenderly loving your fellow believers as members of one family. Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor to one another. Try to outdo yourselves in respect and honor to one another. In seasons, <clears throat> some seasons cause us to be so busy that we neglect the important relationships. The greatest resource that you have in your life is not uh, the natural resources that come from the earth, is not your money, but it's your human resources. Yes. My kids always laugh at me like, you can't go anywhere without knowing somebody. I'm like, because I, I don't have a lot of money, but I sure know a lot of people who have a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a boat, but I got friends who have a boat. <laughs> it's human resources. <laughs> I mean, you got to make sure you, you got to have those things in your life, you know? I don't own property to go hunt on, but I got friends that take me. I don't even own a rifle. But I got friends who have enough for the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> but guys, we have to cultivate our friendships. Stop being so busy with the work that you never take the time to appreciate those that God has placed in your life. It's very important that you appreciate those who God placed in your life. We gather in the wintertime. This is a time, like I said, during Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. We gather, and people who we haven't seen in a long time, hopefully this year with COVID starting to pass by, that we have an opportunity to gather with our family and friends that we hadn't seen in a long time and really begin to tell the story of what we've been through and embrace them and let them know how much we love them and how much we care for them. It's Look, our vertical relationship is important, but God gave us a horizontal relationship that is just as important. Yes. You know, this is a reminder that we don't have to go through life alone. Good. I told the story about my years of struggling with, with stress and suicidal thoughts and depression. But also in that story, you heard me say I had people to call. Yes. I just had a recent crisis where I picked up the phone and was able to call my best, you know, Kevin, one of my best friends in the world. And, and we, I just laid out on him. Sometimes I know he'd be wondering, like, why this dude telling me all this? <laughs> like, he'd keep that to himself. I'm like, no, I don't have to do life alone. Yes. I know I can pick up the phone. He knows he can call me and we can talk about things that I don't have to endure life alone. You don't have to go through what you're going through alone. All I got, look, there was a song that said, as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need nobody else. That is so not biblically true. 
We need people. Come on, say that. Say, I need people. You can't be a loner. Jesus had 12. He had 72. He had the 150, 300, I mean, 500, the multitudes. He had people around him that he shared his life with. When we get to the end of our lives, man, we want to be surrounded with people, not stuff. Cultivate your relationships. Winter signifies the end of a cycle. Winter is a time for rest. Winter is a time for reflection. Winter is a time to cultivate relationships. And lastly, winter is a time to rejoice. It's a time to rejoice. 1 Thessalonians says this in chapter 5, verse 16 is an amplified Bible. It says, rejoice always and delight in what? Rejoice always and delight in what? And delight in what? Okay, so why is it that we think our joy is sourced through stuff? My joy is not sourced in stuff. Winter is the most scarce season for things. That's why we store up for the winter. That's why you see the squirrels working extremely hard when Ollie not shooting them out of the trees and... and, uh, they were just trying to eat. Ali trying to eat too, I guess. I, I don't know. But, <laughs> but that's why the squirrels are storing up and they're storing up and getting ready for the season of scarcity. And while they're in that season of scarcity, we need to make sure that we store up our faith. And because my joy is birthed from my faith in Jesus, that's where I get joy from. That's why you can see people who are sick and get that diagnosis from the doctor that isn't favorable, and then they're able to hold on to their faith. And they're, I, I, It never fails. When I do uh, pastoral care visits to the hospital when they were allowing us down, and they're finally starting to allow us to do that again. And when I would walk into the hospital room, and i never forget, there was a man, he was a double amputee, and and uh, man, they, they just cut off his legs and they were telling him that, you know, he had a couple weeks to live. And I walk in, man, I'm outside. I, those who know me, I'm a crier. So I'm outside crying before I walk in. I'm like, OK, God, help me. I can't be going in here crying. I can't be doing this, God. He needs me. <laughs> so I wipe it off and then I go in the room and I'm like, hey, brother, how you doing? And he's like, man, God is great and greatly to be praised. Do you know that? That Jesus loves you so much. Like he started preaching the gospel to me. And I'm messed up at this moment. Because now I'm like on my knees saying, can you look altar call by your bed? Go and pray for the pastor. And then I realized that the joy wasn't found in having the ability, the ability of his limbs. The joy was found in knowing that I'll spend eternity with Jesus. And so you rejoice because of your faith. It is scientifically proven that the lack of sunshine can negatively impact your mental and emotional state. That's why Seattle is considered one of the most depressing cities in the world because they they barely get sun. And in Alaska, because they they have months of night, you know, the sun ain't coming out tomorrow, but for 30 minutes. <coughs> oh, that was strong. <coughs> what y'all put in my tea? If I do something crazy, I'm not held liable. <laughs> Blame the security team. <laughs> What's that on video? Jeez. <clears throat> don't drink and preach. <laughs> Pastors get so what anyway. But come back. If you find yourself down in the dumps during the winter months, <clears throat> know that everyone has been through it. So don't get caught in the highlights of Instagram. Don't get caught up in the highlights of Facebook and Snapchat. It is exactly that, a snap chat. If you go look at my daughter's Snapchat and her party, you'll see me dancing. But what you don't see is 3 o'clock in the morning 
four ibuprofens later. <laughs> we ain't going to post that. Mm-mm. <laughs> that ain't getting posted. But you're going to see me getting my groove on. <laughs> Here's a quote I want you guys to see. Thankfully, joy is an all-season response to life. True spiritual joy shines brightest against the darkness of trials, tragedy, and testing. True joy shines brightest against darkness. <clears throat> Anyone ever bought a real diamond before? Don't show your hands. I don't want you to get robbed. I don't know these people. I don't know these people like that. But when you go to purchase a diamond from a real jeweler, they take the diamonds and they pour it out, not upon a white sheet of paper, but they pour it out upon a black felt piece of cloth. And the reason they do that is because the diamond purity shows best against something that is the darkest. Mm. What am I saying? You may have had a hard life. You may have went through a tough winter season. But when you place that life against the darkness that you went through in that season, that scripture that says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven now makes sense. That's when it says what man lighted a candle and hide it under a bushel. He says, you are a city that sits up on a hill. That's what it says. And so it becomes a testimony. It becomes an opportunity for you to empathize with people who are having a tough time in their lives and you're able to shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the, into their dark season and tell them that God is good and God is faithful. If you just don't give up, if you just endured this hardship, I promise you that joy is coming in the morning. Who believes that this morning? Who believes that this morning? So in conclusion, as we navigated through this series, which I really enjoyed, guys, I'm telling you, if you missed any one of them, you need to go back and watch them. This is something that you need to have on your playlist, Seasons, Navigating Through Life's Transitions. As we navigated through this series, though, We've learned that there is good in every season, right? No matter how we feel about them, there's good in God in every season. But, but the theme of this series may have been lost in all the good information you got, though. The theme of it may have been lost. But I want to conclude with the final and most important point. And here it is. Write this down. God is the most high. Meaning, there is no one or no thing that is above him. That's what we were trying to tell you through this whole series. That God is the most high. He is sovereign. So if I wanted to make this a seminary lesson, I would call it Theology 101. That God is sovereign. <clears throat> but, you know, y'all make us come up with crafty names. But God is the God of the summer, winter, the spring, the fall, your pain, your heartache, your joy, your triumphs, your victories, your defeats. He is still God and God is, come on, yell it, good. God is good. Come on, everyone stand on your feet right now. Those of you at home, put that in the chat. God is good. They used to say God is good and all the time. That's what they used to say, right? Now that was correct. All the time. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1. There's a season 
for every activity and there's a time for everything under the sun. And God is good in all of those seasons. Thank you for listening to this message from Anchor Chapel. If you'd like to learn more about our ministries or to support us, you can do that at anchorchapel.com. You can also follow us on social media at Anchor Chapel. Have a great week.